Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining Gwinnett County Public Library for our Sundays in Swanee series. My name is Mary Mayer, and I am an adult services specialist for the library. For today's program, we will be featuring author Julius Thompson. Julius Thompson grew up in the Bedford Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, New York, and attended Bushwick High School. The 60s in Brooklyn was an era that had a personality, a feel, and a life force that changed a generation. Mr. Thompson felt this energy and experienced these fires of social change. Today he will be discussing his newest book, Killer Kudzu. After his talk, we will open it up to the audience for questions and also have his books available for purchase. Please welcome Julius Thompson. Thank you. Thank you for the warm applause. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I want to thank the Gwinnett Library System for inviting me to speak today about my novels. This is a, a wonderful experience. Um, you see I'm wearing a, 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 a device on the side. It's from dehydration because I didn't drink enough water. Uh, every four or five days, drink a glass of water. So the doctor said, nope. So I had to get things monitored, but things are getting better. Uh, to me, the adventure in writing is to create different genres and try different things. And today I'm going to talk about the three genres I, I write in. Uh, mainstream, young adult, and science fiction. The latest book is a science fiction, my first, it's called Killer Kudzu. But the other books are very important to me. I have three mainstream books uh, that are part of a trilogy. It started in 1995 and finished in 2011. The first book is A Brown Stone in Brooklyn, and it's about life in the 60s and how things changed and how the whole country changed and the life force that changed it. The second book is Philly Style and Philly Profile. It's about how uh, gangs and war and uh, drugs changed life in a big city. And it's about Philadelphia. And the third book is called, it's called The Ghost of Atlanta. And it's about Can You Return Home Again? And it's about life in Atlanta during the 80s. And it's, it's, what it is, is a fictional journey of a character called Andy Michael Pilgrim. And he lived in Brooklyn, Philadelphia, and Atlanta. And what it is, it tells what happens in the, midst, in the end of the century, what happened in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and how these changed and influenced what we are today. Uh, in this pilgrimage, the readers will learn and fill with some hopes, some dreams, and some fears and that is brought out. My fourth book is called uh, Purple Phantoms and it is a young adult book and it's dedicated to my players because I coach basketball and a teacher here in, in Georgia and I teach at uh, Cross Keys High School. And the basis of the book came because I had three to four players die before their 18th birthday. They were killed in accidents in over the, over the years. And I was thinking, what would happen if they could come back for a season? And what happened in the book, and it's got so many great reviews, is that uh, these five ghosts, they uh, inhabit the bodies of five young players, coexist, and they win a state championship. And then they go back, but at the end, they came for a reason. I won't tell you what it is because it's a little twist at the end. And, but it shows how good people can come back and help, but also the person, people can come back and get better and improve themselves. And that's what these ghosts did. Um, my fifth book, and it happened in a strange way. Uh, it's called Killer Kudzu. And at my church, Grace and I met this church in, in Atlanta, one of my member friends, a very close friend, name is Charles Webb. And he's from South Georgia. And he said, 
Julius, I got an idea for a novel. I said, oh, what is it? I don't take any ideas. He said, what happened if this kudzu turned carnivorous, carnivorous and started to eat people? <laughs> and it's funny, it's a funny title, and it's a funny thing, but you know what? I said, you know what? I am going to, I am going to um, take this and work with it. And it's my first sci-fi novel, and I enjoyed it. Uh, in just a few moments, Miriam's going to show you a YouTube uh, of the book trailer. And, and then I'm going to uh, talk about Killer Kudzu. And what it is, is a pre optolytic semi-horror novel where science has gone terribly wrong. And some people at Georgia Tech decided to experiment. And it's in the book, in the vein of um, books like Pandemic, The Atlantic Gene, and The Hot Zone, and The Day of the Triffids. But it's a southern twist to it, and it's a southern twang in the voices, and it's a southern twang in the, in the um, characters. As a matter of fact, it, if they had not worked hard at the end, no Georgia would be gone because it was attacking and killing North Georgia, all the people in North Georgia. And I wanted to um, create something with a different setting. And before we watch the video, I'm going to um, read an excerpt from the prologue. And it's, uh, the prologue takes place about two weeks before uh, after the attack, but I wanted to get the reader involved in it and, and make sure they got the feel of the book. Um, a Northeast Georgia back roads four weeks after the Randolph tornado. Raymond Camp staggered out the juke joint drunk as a skunk around 11 Saturday night. He was headed home walking down Hog Mountain Road, just out the small town of Randolph. It was a late July night. The moon seemed brighter and fuller than normal. He only had a quarter mile to walk to Horton Street, where he would take short path to his box star style house, trying not to awaken his grandmother. The occasional car passed after he left the road, he wanted to rush because he was trying to relieve himself of seven bottles of beer. Something seemed to miss. He caught a movement out of the corner of his eye. That darn creeping kudzu always seems to be moving eerily. Raymond froze. A yellow puff of air like that of a baby's breath and smelling of jasmine gave, grazed his cheek. Next, something touched his foot curling around his leg and caressing his thighs with the seductiveness that froze his soul. He struggled to make his way back to the road, but Raymond tripped and fell to the ground. He felt cornered as the kudzu vice-like grip entrapped his body. He screamed, but nobody heard his cries. He clawed at the ground, but he was now covered in the aggressive plant. His grip was unyielding squeezing his body, tearing his flesh, and releasing streams of blood as it dragged him into the underbrush. And in this, in this book, you're going to see what happens, how people pull together, how people don't work together, how blacks and whites in the South can work together and cannot work together. And it tackles all kinds of situations. It's not just a, a book about killer plants, but it's about how the human condition affects us all. And I want to create a different kind of novel. The setting is different. You don't find many science fiction novels about the South at all. So I wanted different kind of characters, different people, and a chance to really grow and develop. Uh, the book has got some great reviews, start off good five-star reviews. I'm most happy because uh, Brownstone just received a Literary Titan Award and as one of the best novels in the last 20 years. 
And the Ghost of Atlanta on the reader's favorite beating out over 200 other books for first, for the for a prize. And so it's good to have books you recognize. The third book should get more recognition, and I'm really going to push for it. It's called Philly Style and Philly Profile, because that tackles situations that really affect us today. And so my job is not only as a uh, author, a teacher, an educator, is to make experiences live and make people want to read, want to pull you into the book. The last review for Killer Cousin said it was a fun book, which it is. It's campy, but it's descriptive. And you will, you will see how characters change. You will see how the cuts do evolve. To where at the end, it is like they are almost human-like. And it's going to surprise you at the end. So right now, I think Miriam has, is queuing up the, the video to show you. This is the book trailer from Killer Kudzu. Kudzu, intended as a harmless ornamental plant to shade porches, reduce soil erosion, or as an abundant fodder for livestock. The invasive species grows wild along the back roads of Georgia. The creeping vines expand slowly and steadily. By the 21st century, something has begun to change. Woods has transformed. It has become something harmful, something sinister, something evil. It is spreading, and it is coming for you. Beware the killer Kutsu. The video has got a lot of good uh, reviews, and it kind of catches them what the book is about. And as an author, you know, I, I, my novels have been very serious. This was a fun a book, and but I wanted to try all different kind of genres. My next book is called Emerson Rides the Blue Bike, and it's man versus society, and it's the idea of a mysterious sound in a new subdivision that blares, and when it blares, it only stops when something happens, and usually. There's a death in the subdivision, like Emerson's older brother. So I like to try different things and to push the boundaries sometime. Um, some of my friends, like Terry Kay, who just died, and he was a great Southern writer, told me that when you finish a project, you don't get your butt out the seat until you restart the next project. And that's what I did. When I finished Killer Kudzu, then I jumped right into Emerson Rise the Blue Bike. And I have some other ideas that when I retire from teaching that I'm going to get involved in and in, in writing. I do a lot of uh, speaking uh, at different events. Uh, I've spoken at the Miami Festival of Books, the Virginia Book Festival, Decatur Book Festival, Buffalo Book Festival, New York Book Festival. Uh, Baltimore Book Fest for all up and down the East Coast, and I've uh, been invited uh, some in the summer. Uh, one good thing about uh, Brownstone is it, it's, it's right now it uh, will be put into at the Borough Hall of Brooklyn. They have all the books about Brooklyn that they like, and it's going up there with the tree grows in Brooklyn and the rest. And so I'm really proud, of, really proud of that. And I'm going to be speaking in New York in the in the uh, in the summer. But right now, uh, I try to give you a gist of the books because there's so many. I have another book about writing called Jumpstarting and a Novelist. It's how to how to write books. And I try to encourage people to write and to get involved in writing. I think uh, we as literate people must push reading reading, reading, and reading again. And as an English teacher, I've done that for th almost 30 years. So I think that that is something that every adult should push to the next generation. Their books are full of different things that can help us develop and grow. 
Now, uh, I'm open up to questions and answers. Anyone have any in a Q&A session? Anyone have any questions? I'd be very glad to answer your question. Y yes, ma'am. Your dad for Philly. Did you go there, or did you know someone? Or in Philly style and Philly profile, um, my background is a little different. I was a reporter, newspaper reporter in Philadelphia for nine years. And I saw firsthand the destruction and how it started. But that was the early 70s and how it started and how uh, there were gangs and, and all kind of things going on. Uh, I remember I covered a baseball game between Mir Muriel Dobbins Tech and Mass Bomb and it was like two o'clock in the afternoon. And all of a sudden, everybody's playing baseball, everything's going good. Someone blew a whistle. And when they blew the whistle, about three or four players from each team jumped the fence and ran to join their gangs, right in the middle of it. And I knew then that that, 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 was, some, that was something sinister going on. So for the data, I've got it from the city and I got from uh, different organizations, community organizations in Philadelphia to show what happened and how it happened, when it changed. Uh, and then I showed the influence of sports, how sports kept the city together. High school sports really kept the city together because uh, it, it, it's funny, when, in Philly, if you're an athlete, you can travel between uh, different gang turfs and they never bothered you because they know you was not involved in, in, in that. So that's why I say Philly is a book that, that really, really can, can speak to us and speak to what happens when, again, when the community pulls together and how parents can get out and find their kids and bring their kids back, you know, from, from the edge of destruction. Great question, yes. Um, yes. You spoke about, uh, in your book, uh, Killer Cuts, and how uh, um, the relation between white and black people, um, some ways they worked together, some didn't. Mm -hmm. um, with racism being our killer cuts right now in the country, um, what do you feel um, will work for the white and black race races to be able to work together to to bring, uh, you know, this country to a good place? Good question. And Killer Kudzu, I'm very honest. I, 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 when you read it, you're going to see the N-word in there because it's used in certain places. And I believe in reality. Uh, and you're going to see how uh, it, it affects how instead of attacking the Kudzu, they start attacking each other when there's a problem instead of working together. And the thing that, that I feel, and from I've taught uh, to get a little background, I started teaching uh, in Philadelphia. I've taught in schools that was practically all white, like Jackson County. I taught inner city schools. I taught suburban schools. And the one thing I found in all situations is that if people can communicate, that first get over that first barrier and stop looking and start asking questions and start looking deep inside of each other. And because when I taught in a school, well, I was the only black teacher in the school. And I communicated well, one of my best experiences. Because I was who I was. I got the respect of the kids. And I know some of the, some of the uh, two or three of our parents were KKK members. I knew that. And, but I even had their respect. They came in the parent night. And I think that for, for this country to really pull together it's the barriers have to be broken down. That starts with communication. That's an overused word, but I think it's, it's a word that's effective and that's what we have to do. Great question. Thank you. And in Killer Kudzu, I think you're going to see, you're going to see what happens when they finally decide to pull together and stop a menace. And if you know the thing about symbolism, Kudzu can symbolize a lot of things. It's not just a killer plant. It can symbolize, it can symbolize a lot of things. And I leave that up to the reader to figure out what it is. And, I, and to me, my books, what I try to do is to make people think and to, with entertainment. And so they can grow within themselves and grow as people. Yes, another question? Uh, this hits home because I'm a retired educator. My husband, before he was deceased, was a retired 
English teacher. Mm -hmm. So we had great debates about communication. Yes. And the question that I wanted to uh, ask was, we put emphasis on communication when the children would prefer the internet and to listen to your book on tape rather than sit and read and learn through reading what to do. What are your plans in the future <laughs> to help bring this communication that you want to repeat and repeat to our youth who like to have the easy way out? Well, the first, I want to uh, see what I do in the, what I'm doing now and in the past. In my classes, we have an independent reading time. But they walk in, they have to read for 15 minutes. They pick out a book and they read. Then I ask questions about what they read, and then we start our class. So therefore, I, 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 I encourage, in other words, you, you got to read. I want them to look at the printed page. The thing that gets me is, and when they walk in the room, I take all the phones up. There's no cell phones. I don't want any phone, I don't want, I don't want any electronics interfering with this old-fashioned reading. Also, when I want them to look up words, I have a, 30 dictionaries and you use a dictionary to look up words. The third thing is I'm introduced into the encyclopedia, which, which some don't even know what it is until I explain things to them. So I, I'm one of the last of the old school teachers that are doing that. And so, but in the future what I want to do is to get involved in the community for as going into like the YMCA's, the boys clubs, the different organizations and starting a reading program. What I did was at my church um, we had homeless women, women and children coming in and I established a journal program where I, where I, I bought the uh, composition books, the pens and everything else and when each lady came in I gave her one and, we, I, and they started to journal. And two or three of those journals are now published. And so, you know, I do things like that to, to get people involved in the fact that literacy is so, so important to us. And as, as a community, as a nation, we have to get better at it. And we have to emphasize it. And to me, it goes back to, uh, to, to, to when, they, when the kids are babies. And, and, you know, and you're reading to them, and especially the boys. The boys do not want to read. And you've got to start early with the boys, you know, get them, teach them to read, to appreciate words. And, and you have to be early because I can tell the parents who work with the students. I can tell the parent who pushed the students to read. And because they, they stick out like a sore thumb. When I say read in class, the book is picked up, they open it up and they start to read. The others sit there and try to pretend to read. But I walk around, you don't pretend in here, I want you reading. Because I'm going to have questions for you. You're going to have examine your book. Because every book here, I practically read every book here to understand what they are. So you will be testing, and that test will count towards your grades. So you will read. Um, I know some people want to sugarcoat it, but I don't. In my classroom, you're coming out to work. You know, you have fun sometimes, but it's not for your enjoyment. You're coming out to learn and to grow and to develop. And when, I, when you leave my class, you can go to the next, to 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, because I taught all levels. I've taught uh, classes from 6th grade to Emory freshman. So I know what it likes to, to go from a middle school to college and what it takes to be successful. And that's what I try to emphasize to my students. Great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on... Uh this time that we're in now, and uh, um, the time in the 60s, where there was a great upheaval. Um, what are the similarities that you see, you know, from the time in the 60s and early 70s, and now? Where, where, what have we learned? And, and uh, the thing I see is one word, turbulent. And in the 60s, you had the same kind of uh, pushback. When gains are made, there are pushbacks. And it happened in the 30s, it happens in the 40s, it happened in the 60s, it happened in the 80s, and it happened in now. Whenever gains are made, there's a pushback. And what it takes is, like we did at my church, we talked about it, that you, people who of good conscience have to stand up and speak. 
and we're not doing enough of that. This is the way this is going to happen, or it won't be that way. Uh, progress creates a reaction. And I know I, and I could have done different things and did different things, but I, I'm going to react a certain way. And it's going to be honest, straightforward, and it's not going to be uh, sugar-coated. This is the way it should be. This is where you've got to meet me here, and i got to meet you there, and we've got to come up with a, 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 a way of communicating again with each other over that barrier. But it means you got to give some, and i got to give some. And the thing that gets me is uh, the word that I think is missing in today's society is integrity. And do what you say you're going to do. There's no, there's no such thing as lying. There's no such thing as, as a good lie. No. No. It's the truth. Truth. And I think that's the, that's the thing that we have to work with in developing. It's truth. And that's why some of our books are not books based on on certain things that a lot of people say, oh, I like that because it's going to be all entertainment. It's not. It's entertainment, but you got to think a little bit, too. It's not, you know. And I'm just amazed that, I told you, Brownstone won the Literary Titan Award. Well, when Brownstone came out, it was 2001, right, right before 9-11, uh, and got no publicity. And if you go to on, on the website, the Literary Titan website on my website, you will see that what the author said was that that book was a, just a whole look into the situation in the 60s from a perspective of ordinary people, not just people you see on TV. It was the people that make up the basis of who we are and what we do. Um, matter of fact, uh, the book was the basis of, a, it's going to be another book coming out, not by me, where a New York City uh, researcher and educator about an event that happened in the 60s, a big event that happened. And I, and I knew about it, and I talked to her about it. She read the book, and she got a feel about it, what it was. So I think when we write, we have to give people something that can make them better, not just to entertain. Um, and also, I, in, in Philly, when I, when I wrote in Philly, I was a sports writer and a news writer. And in sports writer, I met the daddy and worked with the daddy oh, when he was a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior in high school. Everybody knows his son, but few people know who he is. It's Kobe Bryant, the son. I know Joe Bryant, Joe Jellybean Bryant, very, very well. And I knew him from time he was in, uh, in fact, I knew his, grand, his daddy, Big Joe. So I know Kobe's grandfather and father. I don't know Kobe at all. But the reason I brought that up is, like in Philly, Joe had to make a decision. Even though he was 6'10", he had to make a decision. He was in West Philly, Bartram High School. And he had to cross Baltimore Avenue in different places. So he had to really focus and really develop himself. And that's brought out in Philly in other books. But I use different names and different things. So I feel that when people write, Writing to me is an expression of the society we're in. It may be, I'm dead and gone, that all of a sudden the books that take off. Because I know it's a lot of times, a lot of books that are written like that don't even get recognized for years and years and years and years and years. I think about The Great Gatsby, another book, who, who would not even recognize when, he, when Fitzgerald was living and did not even get any push until after he was gone 15 years. So it, to me, uh, the, books, the books are in libraries across the country. They are in Chicago, uh, Baltimore, Philadelphia. Uh, there are some books here, some here in, here in Gwinnett, there's some in Atlanta, some in even uh, Walton County. And, uh, they, and I'm pushing now for the, in Philadelphia, Philly Style Philly Profile is in every library. Every library in Philadelphia, they have the book. And I see it's checked out a lot people are reading it. So that that means a lot more to me. Even though I'm not getting the money from it, it's, it's to me it's ideas and getting ideas across to people and how people can take those ideas and how people can grow with those ideas. Great questions today. Yes. So um, I haven't read Jump Story in your inner novels, um, but about um, when someone's just starting writing mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. What are some 
some of the challenges when it has to do with publishing? Because I know there's all kinds of ways to publish now a day. Yeah. Um, so what challenges early on did you have? Uh, that book is based on my nine years of teaching at Emory. I, taught, I was instructed evening at Emory University in creative writing. And uh, two, twofold parts ask the question. The first part is just write. Don't edit, get your ideas down. Then once you feel you have enough ideas down, they can go back and then you can edit. Publishing now is, is the best it's ever been. At one time, a group of publishers in New York City controlled everything, not anymore. This book is Killer Cuts and other books now with Ingram Sparks. And it's, I put, went there because that publisher, uh, they're the ones that supply books to the libraries, supply books to the um, to, to, to bookstores. And so what you want to do, and once you get your ideas uh, that you want to write and you have a publisher book, then you get the book edited. And, and, and in that book, and, and now if, if I change emails, I tell you some places to go. You want to, um, once you get edited, then you look at different ways. You can send out emails, uh, letters to agents called a query letter, and then the agent can look for publishers for you. Or you can self-publish. Right now, some major authors, I mean major, major authors, are self-publishing their books. So publisher only means that you do not go through a, a traditional publisher. And the book is just as well developed as, as, as uh, any book that you would buy. Because it's edited, it's, uh, they have a great cover, and that's, and that's the main thing. You have to get a great cover artist. And there are some great ones out here. Like the one that does my book is Jeff uh, Hayes out of uh, Texas. Dallas, Texas, he's good. My editor is one bit with me 20 years, Dennis DeRose, out of uh, Milltown, New York. He, and he works in New York City. And he edited, he's a tough editor. When we did, we finished the book, and I finished it, we spent three days, four hours a day, going through every word of the book, from the beginning to the ending. So you have to be really dedicated, because you don't want to put anything out that don't, won't represent who you are or what you believe is, is a good publisher book. Uh, my books all, you know, I, I broke a big barrier because my books are on the shelves of Barnes and Nobles, which is, uh, you don't get self-published book on Barnes and Nobles. It broke that barrier. It's, it's on the shelves, you know, across the country. And so because you, you push it and you work hard and, and to me I feel good things have happened, you know, good things happen. Right now Philly is, is being looked at as, as a movie. Uh, the screenplay, I did the screenplay, the screenplay is done, and the producer's looking at it. So hopefully, hopefully, you know, you and I would have chose a different book, but they like it because it's action in it, and it's, and it's gangs and drugs and that kind of stuff. So, you know, they, they, they look at it that way. Uh, matter of fact, when I did it, I talked to some people who had books who turned into movies, and they said two things. Don't go to watch the set. Don't go look at the book. Because you're gonna get angry and mad, you're gonna yank your book out of. You're gonna tell them don't do your book, because it's what they, it's, it's their vision of what they want. They, they're looking at it differently. They were looking to make sales and to, you know, to make splashes and all, and they take all the gory stuff out and make what they want. So I'm I'm happy now. Uh, I I feel really good because uh, the books represent a lot of things in in the, over the years that happened, and I. I think I caught it uh, in the trilogy of Brownstone in Brooklyn and Philly Style, Philly Profile, and Ghost of Atlanta. I caught a 30-year period of time where characters show what it was real, like, what really like, not just what you see on TV. Something that's really, really, really liked. And I think uh, Purple is a Phantom is a book that shows young people that cooperation. It shows a lot of things in it. It shows that you know you overcome tragedy. You know. And Killer Kudzu, I think, is a book where, to me, it's written about the times. And it represents the pandemic, represents a lot of things. It's a lot of things in Kudzu. So I think, well, I, I react to different things. And like, Emerson Rides a Bike, which is the new, which is the new one, and, the, and Jeff did a great cover already on it. I sent him part of the book. He did a great cover already on it. And it's, uh, I think it'd be a different kind of book. It, it's gonna be a mystery. 
It won't just be something, you know, because you don't know what the sound is man-made, you don't know what the sound is alien, you don't know what the sound is, but it's, it's something that's not good. And the mysteries find out what the sound is and why it's doing what it's doing. So as a uh, author, the ideas are there. And, I, and the, matter of fact, it's a quick story before I go. Uh, the trilogy, if you think Brownstone, Philly, and Ghost in that order, but it's not. It is that order, it's, you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s, but I wrote Philly first. Philly is actually the oldest book I've written. It's two years old in any other, in, in Brownstone. And what happened was I wrote the book, but my editor looked at me and said, Julius, this is not the beginning. This is like the middle part. This is not the beginning. Something happened before to make this, make this character go to Philly. So what I did was I went back and then worked on Brownstone, which is, uh, which is about the, when he was younger. So interesting, people see a trilogy read it in that order, but don't realize sometimes it's not written in, <laughs> written in you know, in, 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 in a timeline, a time sequence. But uh, some great questions today. Any other questions? Yeah? Good. I want to thank you so much for coming out, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I want to thank Gwinnett Library for inviting me to speak today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I want to thank all of our guests for coming out today for our Sundays in Swanee series. And thank you to author Julius Thompson um, for sharing um, about um, the emphasis of the importance of literacy um, with our kids and with society, the societal problems that we still face, um, and the process to getting your book published. So thank you so much, and we hope that you have a wonderful day.